pretty much every professional indemnity policy for our class of business, um, unless there's something unusual happening, will have cyber written out. So it'll be specific in there now mm. that there is no cyber coverage. One, two, three, First and foremost, just introducing uh, Chris Davies. So welcome, Chris, to um, the latest in our podcast, Sense of Identity. As everyone knows, this is about um, not just talking about the industry, but the people in it and the people that are perhaps slightly infamous in there as well as famous, uh, but certainly well known. Uh, uh, so. Firstly, welcome, Chris, uh, to uh, to our podcast. Good, good to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. So just to, I, I thought I may I'll do a quick intro. Chris and I have known each other for an awful long time, been in many, many years, which neither of us want to sort of reflect on just how many have gone past, actually. In fact, Chris, a few minutes ago, just before we came in, suggested that we were perhaps both weirdos because we found certain subjects interesting that others might not. But I'm hoping this uh, this chat will, will, will tick that box. But Chris is uh, the executive director of Howden's. Howden, excuse me. Um, we're going to talk more about the sheer scale of, uh, of Howden and the brand and what it means to people in the context of Chris's experience. But if I may, first of all, I think probably a lot of the financial services industry, Chris, will know you from your past endeavours and activity. You've been involved in some huge businesses that have been real technical innovators as well as uh, penetrated that whole market in, in a massive way. And I wonder if you could just give us a bit of a background, first of all, about your history, and then we'll move into the connection to current days, if that's okay. Yeah, sure, of course. I mean, I think, um, as you say, I've been been very lucky in my uh, time. I always hesitate to use the word career because I'm not quite sure that's the right word for it. But time, I think, is a better way to describe it. To work with some, you know, some very, very uh, in the t- innovative firms and people, to be fair. Uh, and uh, you know, along the way, I've managed to to probably hoover up quite a bit of um, you know thoughts from others and, and seen what what's good and what's bad in terms of different practices. And in the round, um, you know, growth has always probably been at the key to what we've really enjoyed or I've really enjoyed. Like finding businesses and, and trying to help them grow and expand, you know. And, and the other side of it, I suppose, is um, but going back to the uh, bit of the kind of geekiness. A lot of my background started. Well, I first started as being a financial advisor, of course. So I was on the coal mm-hmm. phase, and then moved into the regulation side. You know, with some of the probably kind of household names, um, you know, in banks and uh, bank issuers as they were at that time. And then slowly moved into the into the more kind of private side of the industry, rather than in the large national um, sort of institution businesses. I, and really got to experience, I think, uh, a lot of of business growth in terms of you know what I became to understand about how we can grow businesses. You know, starting to understand about P and Ls things I've never had to think about before. Uh, and having done that for probably the last 25 years um, in various guises, either as part of businesses, as directors and shareholders of businesses, probably back in 2006, probably, you know, that's probably one of the more, more recent things, uh, set up uh, our, our own business with it, with my business partner then and uh, called Two Plan. And Two Plan, again, tried to take much of what we'd learned in the past and put a slightly different spin on it at that point. But, but essentially, the key to all of these things, I think, was trying to find ways that we could make day-to-day mundane processes efficient, try to alleviate as much of the kind of day-to-day stress and, and kind of regulatory pressure that advisors were feeling, whether they be financial advisors or mortgage advisors or insurance, or whatever area that they're in. I'm just trying to find a way to essentially make their lives a little bit easier. And typically, I think, from looking back at my time as an advisor, doing what really most advisors like to do, which is deal with clients. And yeah. if you can if you can remove as much of the stress and the day-to-day hassle, you know, that's probably a good thing in, in, in our take. And, that, and that's really what I suppose the, the kind of USPs, as you might call it, of what we tried to deliver. It wasn't to replace the advisor-client relationship in any way, but just to facilitate and make it easier for them to do more of what they wanted to do. Yeah, and and, and, and I guess certainly from my my uh, view of history, and as I say, it goes back a long way. I mean, you were definitely involved way back when you weren't just trying to change that whole sort of distribution, um, you know, uh, l- uh, landscape, but also the technology um, that was going to help free up time for advisors and all those things. So I know, you know, at a very early stage, we sort of, you know, there was a lot of synergy in, 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 in and you were dealing with a much broad, as I say, landscape and a large number of uh, intermediaries and things. So, uh, you know, it's it's, um, it's really interesting because I think a lot of others latterly tried to emulate some of the models that went in play early on, early doors. So, so yeah, I think there was a big impact on there on, on, on that sort of contribution and things. The, the bit that I think probably is really interesting is you're probably one of the few people in the context of sort of the financial services industry, where it's come from, where it's arrived at 
so far and its journey, you know, can comment on both sides of the, you know, so to speak, the fence, you know, from a risk perspective now with Howden um, and, you know, reflecting on what the day to day problems are for intermediaries. So I think what would be great as well, if you can, is just people don't necessarily understand the sheer scale and, and uh, you know, uh, of Howden and what they provide into the financial services market. So it'd be great to get your your uh, input feedback on yeah, that as well. Yeah, you know. I, yeah of course. And I, and I think, and I, th- and I think, you know, when, uh, you know, we, we, we saw, uh, to plan quite some time ago now and I think when looking for a new challenge I think I think essentially that's what excited me about how and I think really caught us to be able to use that experience with a different focus you, you know it's, it's very exciting so how um as it stands today um you know is a massive organization across the globe but I started to deal with a part of how today that was called Windsor so that the company that we I used to deal with by our professional indemnity insurance was called Windsor and Windsor was essentially bought by how I mean, in terms of you know many years ago now but the nucleus of what we do kind of stems back from from those days and I, and I can remember um, first dealing with Windsor as it would have been, Howden as it is now, for the first uh, pensions review, believe it or not, when, um, so that could, not the ones we've just gone through, we all, we feel that we've gone through, but, but but obviously the first one that happened. So my relationship goes a long way. And and I thought what they did for the firms that I've worked with along the way has been invaluable. And that, so having been a client for a company for, I don't know, whatever that would be, 23, 24 years, 25 years, I don't know. It's a long time, certainly well over two decades. So having been a client of the company for over two decades, to then to get the opportunity to go and actually run the team that that, that you kind of acted for, that also acted for you, you know, is is quite a privilege and quite quite something to do. So I, I'm really, really enjoying it. But what I, I suppose, what have I been able to bring to the party? Well, to some degree, I don't try to pretend I have the insurance technical knowledge because, look, we've got people in my team who've been there for 30 years, right? And there's no... There's no catching up. There's no catching up with them. I'm not. I'm not that. You know, I'm not able to do that. But what I am able to do is kind of sit, I guess, on the fence, on the, you know, straddle the fence or straddle the line, and as you say, try to make sure that all of the insurers that we deal with really understand what the advisors do day to day, understand the transition that they've been through, so so that really that we can make sure that it's very clear about where we believe the risks are inside advisor businesses, and they need to be, um, you know, addressed accordingly. But there are still, unfortunately, some uh, ghosts and some historic things that uh, insurers I believe are still you know common practice for advisors and they clearly aren't so it's dispelling those kind of myths when we find them i'm just trying to make sure that really that the the population of financial advisors in the uk you know get a fair deal uh, yeah. and i think you know fair, fair enough if there's um particular risks that need to be dealt with and that's kind of going to cost you more fine but for the day-to-day uh, you know more run-of-the-mill financial advice businesses they shouldn't be paying for the sins of you know some of those those firms that are on the on the periphery that have got up to you know things you all wish they hadn't got to you know, the benefit yeah. So it's yeah. able to do that, I suppose, and, that, and that's probably the key thing that I can kind of well, I try to sit in the middle and try to do that. And that, and it's a really it's a really interesting one. And and, and again, you got to be careful not to talk too much out of turn. But it's a hard, really hard job. In terms of my experience, in the same, you know, I'm on the periphery of this stuff, but looking in on it, that whole, um, you know, when you've got a, a set of legislation which has got this sort of retrospective nature to what it can look back and then decide was the the right way to do something without having laid that in the first place. You know, advisors always seem to have suffered at the hand of that. Now at the same time, I guess you've got to be sympathetic to the fact that the risks the PI insurers are similarly trying to cope with you know a set of risks that are evolving um in front of their very eyes and and and, you know when you're when you're trying to provide an insurance around something which is uh principles based legislation that's really really tough the pen you know you say that that that's a perfect example you cited there from my own memory the pensions legislation where they suddenly said oh do you know what perhaps what we said before wasn't quite right and we might well decide to act based against our current knowledge (laughs) having never really given you the you know the right and how do you how do you deal with that as an insurer as well i mean i I mean that like, as I say, it's probably a big ask to ask that question, you know, without your technical colleagues. But that, that's that's hard, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I think I think the key to it is the roundabout thing is that you need to make sure that whoever's the underwriter, so whoever's leading, if you like, from the insurer, um, you, you need to as best you can make sure that you're dealing with people who've seen some of these things because there's no there's just no substitute for experience, and and it's why I think unfortunately we're not going to get to a kind of you know, go compare situation with this type of type of insurance because you can't just key in the details and get somebody to understand the risk. The key thing, I suppose, is because as much as anything, exactly the point that you just addressed, it professional indemnity insurance is what we call claims made insurance. 
So it's basically not when you gave the advice. It wasn't the fact that you were driving a car 10 years ago. Well, that doesn't mean anything this year, but it does in our world because mm-hmm. it's about when it's not about when you gave the advice. It's when the consumer or where the regulator decided there was a, a circumstance or a claim came about. So it's when it lands. So as you say, it's not it's not really about ensuring the work that you're going to do this year, although that's part of it. Much of the task is trying to look back, look at what the work you've been involved with over the, you know, the, the period that you're trying to gain insurance for and also try to predict what might happen with the regulator or any other interventions that might come forward. So it very much, in, in my opinion, is is an art rather than a science. And that's why yeah. you do need an experienced you know, person to deal with at each insurer that mm. wants to write this particular class. Because yeah. if you don't, you know, you can make some wild assumptions that are wrong. Um, you know, you can read up things if you read the, you know, the financial press. Uh, and they might be talking about issues that have or haven't happened or speculation. But you really need somebody with, with who's kind of immersed themselves in this class. And there are a number of lead underwriters out there that have that experience. And we try wherever possible to to deal with those, for, you know, with those insurers because they've just been in and around it for much longer. Yeah, yeah. And, and I guess where our world sort of intersects um, is, is a yet another evolution of risk. You know, we've chatted about this and, you know, uh, again, we had an ongoing discussion about how, you know, various businesses like ours can work together because the cyber market, of course, now and cyber risk suddenly comes into play. And there was during one of our early discussions, you started to share with something which I thought was fascinating around how that market's evolved and how the Lloyd's floor, for instance, has decided to look in on on cyber. You, you mentioned a phrase which I'd be, would be fabulous if you can just to explain this silent cyber concept because I think you know people aren't aware of what professional indemnity insurers, underwriters are having to consider and twist and turn around given the advice that they're getting from Lloyd's. Would you mind, again, I've not described that very well, but I think it would be fascinating for people to understand that dynamic if you can describe it. Yeah, of course. I, I think you've done a pretty good job on it, but to be fair. But um, <laughs> essentially, essentially, what what there was, a, without going into too much of the detail, as you say, effectively, the Lloyd's market undertook a bit of a review of different types of insurers, different classes of insurers, different professions. And, and essentially, the crux behind it, which makes perfect sense, is that what they were trying to do was to make sure that the policies responded consistently to to similar events. So there was no ambiguity. You know, if you were a really good client, you know, would 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 the policy respond to a you know a cyber type incident, for example? And if it did. What they were trying to say is, well, it should be explicit, and it should be explicit that they, that cover has been provided, and it should provide cover for everybody who has that type of policy wording or type of contract. What we found is, and this term silent cyber was, that many policies were written in such a way as they they didn't seem to really explicitly say that they did, and they didn't really explicitly seem to say that they didn't. Mm. And when when Lloyd's looked at that in a bit more detail, I think they were concerned that it, there could be some element of if you were a particularly big client, maybe you could kind of you know persuade the insurer to cover that kind of claim. If you were somebody on a smaller end of the spectrum, then perhaps you couldn't because you didn't have the level of sway or premium or back book or whatever else it was. And and I think what it did essentially then said right. What you've got to do, all insurers, it's explicitly in or out. You can't sit on the fence. This silent cyber has to go. And of course, typically, or as in any business in reality, if you make an insurer or any other, you know, any other line, I suppose, make a decision, what are they going to do? They tend to retreat rather than go forward. Uh-huh. And that's what happens. So essentially, pretty much every professional indemnity policy for our class of business, um, unless there's something unusual happening, will have cyber written out. So it'll be specific in there now mm-hmm. that there is no cyber coverage uh, whatsoever in, in inside your professional indemnity policy. There are lots of good reasons why that might be the case in terms of the structural policies and what they're trying to cover rather than, you know, professional risks rather than, um, you know, cyber attacks. But nonetheless, it is important for people to understand where where they're exposed. So mm. there's the professional um, negligence type claims, which professional indemnity policies pick up. But as you said, and as our conversations have developed over the last well number of years, I know since we started talking, but totally more probably accelerated into this area. It, it's certainly something that we're we're trying to promote really that firms do give a lot of thought as to how this kind of cyber risk. Uh, kind of comes about because I think there are two things we see. One is that certainly for more SME size businesses, there's a there's probably a general thought about well, it's never going to happen to me because surely you know they 
the cyber criminals are going to be attacking your Barclays banks or some, you know, some household names or whatever it is. Why are they going to find Chris Davis, IFA, you know, working on the high street in, in you know, in Harrogate or whatever? Um, and of course, the truth of the matter is that's not how it happens. There's, you know, they, these people are sending out millions, I dare say, of yeah. emails, you know, on a regular basis. And you just have to be unlucky or somebody in your organization has to be unlucky enough at one point to, to respond to one or, or do something, you know, just by accident or just because they're not concentrating. Um, and I think the advent of working from home, you know, there are a whole manner of of reasons and rationales, I think, why these things are going to come very much into the, the forefront of people's thinking. Yeah. And we certainly see that. And when we ask them the question, well, well, what would you do if it happened to you? Understandably, again, I think for most people, their business is a financial advice business in one way, shape or form. So yeah. why would they know what to do in the event of a, you know, a cyber hack or a ransomware yeah. attack? It's new territory, isn't it? I mean, that, 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 it that's, is. Exactly, yeah. that's the scary bit. You know, and I know we've had sort of collective discussions, with, you know, including our you know, mutual friend Ian McKenna at FTRC. And, you know, he's, he's uh, banging the drum around, well, everything tech really in the industry, uh, as he rightly should, So, which is fabulous. You know, um, hopefully we'll see how those discussions evolve forward to, you know, try and consider the betterment of the industry and consumers and all that stuff. But but I mean, what I think is really interesting is when we talked about this in the context of Howden and those principles about visibility and understanding and being upfront about what it is you're covering and, you know, an education, you know, that, that, that's, that's got to be good. That's got to be good for everybody, isn't it? Yeah. So, so, you know, like you, like you say, uh, hopefully we'll, we'll see how that evolves forward. But um, yeah, it, it's, it's fascinating just to see how the market is trying to change to cater for those changing risks. I mean, from my understanding, how they're involved with many billions of, you know, the, the numbers are in billions when you consider how the scope of its cover. Uh, and for th those of you that recognise the logo there in the background with Chris, you know, you've seen that a lot on the London Underground because, uh, yeah, and, and the, the ads are fascinating from oil rigs to, you know, I mean, it's so diverse. As a specialist in the PI market and particularly in financial services, I mean, I think the stats are extraordinary I mean, in terms of the percentage, and again, by by virtue of uh, the coverage of the market. I mean, can you share any more about that to give people, uh, you know, that experience, where that comes through in terms of how much yeah. the market you're involved with? Yeah, of course. I mean, and I think I think essentially it's, it's sometimes quite difficult to really be exact on what how big the market is because there are some there are some companies, Paul. You know, that some of the you know the, the most without mentioning any names, some of the, the some of the some of the kind of household names that don't really insure in the London market. They might self-insure or do their, make their own revenue. So, so it's probably sometimes it becomes difficult to work out exactly how big the market is. But from what we can determine, we think that we represent around about 40% of mm. the, um, if I call it the financial advice or regulated advice market, yeah. we think we represent about 40% of that. Now, it depends how you slice and dice it, but, but that would probably be um, yeah, you know, would be would, would be a fair representation. So it's quite it's quite a significant population, if you like, that, that we look after and we help and we try to you know obtain yeah. the best terms for. And, and with a real heritage as well, like you say. I mean, I actually remember the Windsor, the logo, and all that. You know, yeah. And you think back this how many years that years ago that is. You know, that that's a, an awful lot of experience. Now, the, the other stat you mentioned to me, which I thought was equally fascinating, was because so, while cyber insurance is available. Um, you know, it, it, it people. It, it doesn't seem to have been something that as yet people have really taken up or focused on in the same way as necessarily making. You know, again, dare I say it, the right provisions to cover themselves those cyber risks. Again, we're, we're looking at that collectively, aren't we, in terms of what people should think about. But yeah, but do you have any stats around around the cyber market in in its current you know it, coverage on that 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 perspective? Or? We 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 do track that. Uh, I'm not. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm going to sound really kind of. But I'm not probably totally at liberty to tell you what that number is. Yeah, but if I if I can paint a picture, maybe we can do it. Certainly, Perfect. and, and it, it it's extremely extremely low, and and I think or surprisingly low. Let's maybe put it that way, because for me, I, I I would imagine in terms of who's most likely to you know come up with um, an act or an interference with my business right now is you know I'm in control of what I do as a financial advice business. I, you know I can control that. I know who the advisors who work for me are. I know my staff and everything else. But actually, somebody sitting in a foreign client you know, attacking my business when I don't even know about it and trying to find vulnerabilities. Mm. It, it it does really, I think, send a bit of a shiver up your spine if you think that all it takes is somebody to receive an email saying, you know, purporting to be whatever, Amazon or something where, you you know, you're expecting a delivery. And I think the the, the recent sort of uh, developments that we've seen over the last 12 months or so, Paul, you, you, and you'll be far more eloquent than, than I'm describing this, but the kind of use of, 
artificial intelligence and and sort of deep fakes, um, you know, it's definitely going to come to the forefront. And and I think we can sort of we probably still have a view as an industry that I'm going to see an email. It'll probably have spelling mistakes in it. It'll probably have very bad grammar. It'll probably be you know, something that is so blisteringly obvious that, you know, anybody even half asleep in the morning can spot it. Mm. That's mm. not that's not what we're talking about now. That, 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 those days <laughs> those days of those emails are, are long, long, long gone, you know, and um, they, they, no, they, they, you know, they, they, they'll appear or purport to come from people. It'll look like that on your email. You know, you can explain this better than I can, but, you know, they, they, no, it'll, it'll say it's coming from Paul Holland or Chris Davis. It'll look no different. The foot will be the same. Um, you know, uh, if somebody's recording this now and, you know, look at my voice, my understanding is that with something like 100 words, you can probably now record my voice and play any message that you probably want back to somebody in my team and they'll think it's me yeah, yeah so if yeah. they get an email from me or purporting to be from me then they get a phone call on their voicemail or they or whatever and it says can you just do this that or the other it's, it's, it's a yeah. high bar- it's a high barrier for us to expect all our staff to be able to yeah. you know to meet at every single minute of the day because that's the pressure that we're under now uh, you exactly. know you must have you must have seen you know all of that develop and and you know your business in itself is is trying to combat that isn't it i mean it it does if you stop and think about it, you know, how do I know I'm talking to you now? I mean, how do yeah. I know you're not a deep fake? <laughs> well, I mean, that's the question, isn't it? Yeah, this is it. This is it, yeah. As I said before, I've got a face for radio. I wouldn't be publishing this if I uh, <laughs> if I, if I was faking. I'd have, I'd have definitely doctored it. But, I mean, you're right, though. That The degree of sophistication in that stuff is just increasing every day. And, you know, even people people now are sort of... that The human element of this is just so important in training and things. And, again, I know it's something that's been uh, been mentioned in, in, in other podcasts. But it, literally, I'm think about the tone of an email being slightly out you know out from the norm and yeah. maybe even the sign off the way someone says goodbye to you you know that it may be as little as that but if, if, if you want to see something really scary about where this is moving in terms of ai and i know this is being thrown at everybody but look up at uh, um uh, the latest evolution in 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 this around uh production of animation and video called sora s-o-r-a just it's worth a look you know the idea that you can spell out in a set of words uh visualization of a of a video animation and the engine behind the scenes will literally take your words and create a video i mean that, that's how fast this is moving so like you say people people i think need to be sympathetic slightly to the fact that when you're trying to provide an insurance that's covering a market that is evolving at that place that's not easy um so uh yeah experience must count for it so much i should think well, and i think one of the other things that people i mean there's probably a number of prongs to the kind of cyber insurance piece. Uh, what one of them, or really, is the sort of what I would call the kind of panic button. You know, the kind of the red. You know, the the, the you know the theoretical red button that you just hit when something happens. Because mm. if you don't have the skills or experience or knowledge to understand how to deal with one of these things, if I say if or maybe when they will happen to to all of us, mm. unfortunately, at some stage. Yeah. Um, that's one of the the key things I think, certainly for smaller businesses, or I don't know, and, and even larger businesses for that matter. But it's just to have the ability to say, right, something's happened. I don't know how to deal with it, and it it always sort of makes me chuckle in a kind of strange way, I suppose, because. If you imagine the situation, we spend probably all our lives saying, do not click on links that you don't expect because in an email because it may be from a hacker. And then what we do is we get an email from a hacker that we know is a hacker and we go click on this link to take us to the dark web. Now, if there's not an irony in that whole thing, right, that, that the way you've got to deal with it is by doing everything that you've thought for years, you know, you shouldn't do. But yeah. I don't know, should you? Should you click on that link? Should you? It, should, you know, I don't know. I mean, I'm not yeah. but should you? Oh, you know, yeah. who knows? In fact, does that make the situation worse? Is it? Who knows? But that's what that's what the red button is for. That people that's what I'm dealing with. Yeah, yeah. Having, having a plan, I mean, it's one of the things actually that came out again in the conversation with Ian, but um, you know, so, sort of making sure everyone in your business knows who do you turn to, where you face off to, you know, what is your plan of action, um, but but also trying to make sure you're putting in measures that just try and make sure that you're uh, less likely to be that target. I mean, unfortunately, the very nature of financial services and particularly with advisors, you know, they're, they're dealing with high value transactions. They're, they're going to be, a you know, naturally a big target. Professional services is in general, in their legal and accountancy, anybody dealing with sums of money, then, but they, you know, they're not, they might be seen as a soft target. So it's um, it's, a, it's a scary subject, but, but nonetheless, you know, you can't sort of uh, put your blinkers on and uh, ignore it, unfortunately, which is what we're trying to sort of advocate, isn't it? 
in. And I, and I think, Bob, again, to, to your point, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's not just dealing with a financial transaction. And I, and I always think about that. I mean, as, as dreadful as it is, you know, with the bank, when somebody can know about everything you've done and possibly have access to your accounts. For a lot of financial advisors, though, the data that, that they hold, I think, goes a, a step or two further on. Why so it would be about yeah. my sexual orientation, particular health uh, situations, or, or, you know, my history, medical history. So some of those things, people might have an idea about my bank account, but some of those things, you know, hardly anybody in the world know really about something. Yeah. So yeah. It, it, it's data that possibly has a slightly different connotation to the kind of hard financial data that we talk about. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and bizarrely, it's one of the things, isn't it, that technology perhaps has helped us in so many ways, but, you know, there's a very little likelihood of, you know, Billy Burglar breaking into your office and stealing your filing cabinet full of fact files, was it? I mean, it just, mm. it just wasn't mm. going to happen. You know, they'd have broken their back, you know, trying to get them down the stairs in the first place. But yeah, actually, yeah. what's made huge strides in business efficiencies for us has that's also a created thing. a vulnerability, you know, in terms, Absolutely. Of, in terms of that. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, no, fascinating. I think it is, it's actually been, I mean, we could probably talk about this subject as we've done and probably will do again over a glass or two of wine in the future that's been really fascinating i think it's quite also it, it's just nice for people to understand uh just some of the things they need to think about you know and and, and again to i mean the, the, as i say howden is probably a brand people are becoming much more familiar with because they've seen as i have locally you know the a plan brand being uh, superseded by howden um so so again you're going to see it pop up more and more but i think it's quite nice for people to understand the background to that um just just before we finish and i can't help myself but do this i always do it at the end of these sessions and i should have forewarned you but i didn't probably not a bad thing i always tend to ask people if you were going to give yourself uh, a a piece of advice your younger self can you think of you know it doesn't have to be one but you know what what would what advice would you give your younger self with with the with the uh, all of that knowledge you've got under your belt now well two things one is one is i would never have listened to anybody who's got this much gray hair so so whatever it would have been i probably would have ignored so i should probably say that for the, for the purposes of, of disclosure <laughs> i i think i've been very very fortunate paul in, in my in my world you know my work life i've been i've been very very lucky i've met i've met a lot of people and and probably what i would do is is i would say always you know use your listening skills i think i think there were times in my younger days where i probably you know the proportionality of talk versus listening was probably slightly wrong and i've learned so much as i've got older by listening to people who have experience on topics i'm, I'm trying to you know take heed of that but I, if, if they know what they're talking about for me let them do it you know yeah. don't try to become an expert in something you don't need to be an expert in it's hard enough being an you know an expert in the in the one area so to listen more i'd say to that my younger self and, and do you know it, sometimes you, people with grey hair do have a thing or two to uh that's worth listening to those are probably be the things i'd say oh that's a really good one that's really good listen chris davies uh really appreciate you uh your time and uh, words of wisdom um thanks for joining us good to talk to you paul take care